All right, brother. Okay, I have hit record, and so here's what that means. Now, I know I know that you grew up in Louisiana, but you spent ample time in Texas, and by way of Georgia, you've made it back to the Lone Star State. And because I have pushed the red button, Cullen Barbado, my longtime friend, my brother from another mother, you are now a Texas Titan. So update that LinkedIn profile, amigo. I am a proud Texan and glad to be back in the state and back with my buddy, Jason. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. And the reason I called you to come on is uh, I've thought about it for, for a while. And this kind of with what we have going on was kind of the tipping point that, yeah, it's time to to do our interview. Because, I mean, if ever there is a guy that understands operations, understands business, understands leadership, you know, West Point grad, uh, college golfer, uh, a military officer, and then a lot of success in the business world, both from a Fortune 500 standpoint uh, to startup. You know, you kind of cover the gamut and uh, lar- you know, really large people-centered organizations, um, you know, more kind of information. You, you kind of cover all bases, check all the boxes. And then now I know that you're doing a lot of advisory work to, to companies that are trying to figure out how to pivot in the new environment we find ourselves with COVID-19 and all that. So I just wanted to kind of take it like this, Colin. First of all, I want to you know get into kind of your background and how it's kind of – it's funny because I met you so early in your career. And, and just so the listener knows, Colin literally – you know, the, there's this thing in the Bible that, that talks about – um, as iron sharpens iron, so one man doth another. And if there is one constant that I can say as far as from a a, a, a friend, a brother, someone that I could always depend on, and, and I hope vice versa throughout my entire weird winding career, it's been Colin. And uh, and so to watch that evolution is is it has been fun. And uh, maybe we'll even cover like some some trips to a golf tournament, uh, trips to California yeah, that we've yeah. been a part of. We got all kinds of yeah. stories we can We cover. can throw some stuff and see what sticks. Yeah, exactly. Let's just tear down the floodgates. Yeah. 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 Ex- ex- expand that band. The band of excellence. Absolutely. Well, let's expand them. So, yeah, I, I, I would say I'm the, I'm the, the, 20 year journey that we have been on um, and uh, I, you know, walking into your house when we first meet and, and Abby is in diapers toddling around. I think she may have been 18 months, barely kind of walking and moving around and then to see your girls now and where they are and what they've, what they've become uh, just, just an amazing um, seat to watch your journey and your family's journey. And, um, uh, just to, to be along for the ride and ride sidecar with you on this and, and help wherever I can and share what I've learned and said, don't, don't do these mistakes. And uh, it's been uh, what an incredible journey. What a blessing. Uh, you know, your, our friendship you are to me. Well, the, the feeling is mutual, man. And, you know, one of the things where I, kind of where I want to start this thing, because it's one of the coolest stories and I don't understand where, and maybe you can explain. It. I've never really drilled down on this that much, but um, so you're a, you grow up. Your grandfather has a golf course, so literally you take a, a a liking to golf at a very early age. I mean, it's literally you spend your days on the golf course as a child, and so you become very good and good enough to where you're going to be able to play Division One golf. And I know that um, you looked at at SMU, which was um, it, it, for those who don't know. It, and I'm not just saying this because I, I have a uh, a degree that I do not use from SMU, but um, I I do. Uh, they are a golf school, man. It's Payne Stewart, you know, just a, I mean a, a storied program there. You had that opportunity. It's known for golf, and you have the opportunity to go there, and you end up playing golf at West Point. Not so much known for golf, and, uh, and but the reason behind that, I know that I know some of that story. That's where I'd like to start because to me, I think that it says so much about your, your, uh, not contrarian. That's probably the wrong word, but just your, your ability to, um, choose a path that while it might not be the easiest or the most likely you, you welcome the challenge. And I think that's something that was a, that I know of you was a really critical and pivotal moment in your life where you chose something that was completely out of the ordinary. So 
talk about that and then let's just kind of take it from there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I remember that decision, um, like it was yesterday. And, you know, if I boil down the decision to answer your initial question of why, why West Point over SMU and to play college golf, it, it's, uh, it's somewhat laughable. Um, when you think about the program and the, and the folks that come out of SMU and I had the chance to caddy, we had a tour a mini tour event. It was back then it was called the Ben Hogan tour. Uh, it's been the web.com tour and now it's the corn Ferry tour, but an event that came through my town every year. And I caddied for this guy and he was an all American at Arizona. He was a, a Southern amateur champion. He um, had a storied amateur career. And he was out there and he was he was good. He was really good, but he was just off by a little bit. And he was sleeping in his car, driving from tournament to tournament to try to make enough money to try to make it on the big tour. And he's having to make phone calls. You know, um, back then there were no cell phones. And so, you know, he's on the club phone and I'm standing there next to him and he's asking for money to get to the next event. And it's something just struck me of like, boy, do I do I want to play for do I want to play for food? Is this something that I want to do or do I want to play just for the love of the game? And it was that kind of moment. And I'm 17 at this time. I'm a senior in high school. It's the spring of my senior year in high school. And it just struck me of I just want to play for the love of the game. I don't want to play for food. Mm-hmm. And. So I had to, I did my my visits, you know, the, those visits that athletes go do, and one of them was at West Point in January, and it was uh, really cold and very gray and icy, and um, there was just something about the challenge of it that I thought, you know, if if I'm going to give up, my dream, my entire life was to play Augusta National. Now, fast forward, you know. 30 years later, I will get the opportunity to play Augusta National. I will not play in the Masters, but I'll get to play it. So, I mean, I had a, at 10 years old, I had a green blazer. I mean, that's what I, I mean, I had one blazer and it was green because that's what I was going to do. And so to have that dream from kind of seven years old all the way to, you know, 17, and I, I, you know, I played golf probably 325 days a year. If it was raining, I didn't play. Um, and so to to lose that, you know, not to, to to pivot, and I would call it, you know, now today we use that word pivot, is if I'm not gonna if I'm not gonna go down that challenge, then I'm gonna go do some other challenge that I think is just as hard, or maybe even harder, and I'm gonna go do that, and I get the chance to go do that. And so, um, I, I, West Point was so far out of the realm of, of thought, I didn't even know what it was until a golf coach called me, and. When I went around, because you had to get, um, you know, uh, congressional uh, nomination, and you had to go through that process, and teachers had to do a bunch of stuff, and counselors, and so, you know, I'm going around getting all of this stuff, and teachers are, are telling me because I'm a, I'm, I'm a laid back person, and and that's my personality. I play golf, and and I mean, teachers are asking, Colin, are you sure you know what you're doing here? And I said, yes, ma'am. I. I this is what I want to do. Are you, what have you, do you know what it is? Are you sure this is what you really want to go do? And yes, ma'am, this is what I want to go do. And, and turned out that, that, that style and how I took it, um, I have a very adaptable role with it style and approach to life. And, and I think that it's rooted in, um, it, 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 it's rooted in, in what God says about who we are is that he created us. Uh, he made us this way. He has a purpose and a plan. And the rest of it is just, it's going to take care of itself. And so yeah, to, to have that as a, as a young person and, a, uh, you know, the spiritual legacy I have from my grandparents, and my parents to be rooted in that is I am loved because God loved us first. And, and there is nothing I need to do or nothing I need to prove in order to earn that. I can't earn it. And so I think that that from a from a young person's um, and just growing up that way, it was just an opportunity to go do something hard. And I figured, boy, if I can go do this, then I can probably just do about anything. Mm-hmm. And that's that was kind of the, the the mentality that I went into it. And turned out golf was a it was an incredible blessing 
um, and escape from the, the from the stress of it to go do something that I truly love. And the guys that I got to play with are lifelong dear friends today. I work with one of them now. Um, I talked to I talked to three of them this week already about different stuff. I was on a conference call with one of them this afternoon. He runs a you know an operations group uh, call, and he asked me to speak on that one, so I did that right before this. So just that connectivity to that, and to go do something that I love to do as a childhood passion, um, while I did this other thing, was just um, uh, an amazing blessing and an incredible adventure. Um, and sometimes look back on it kind of now I'm looking back on it going 25 years ago going, wow, I really did that. Okay. Um, and uh, just an, an incredible experience. Well, and then as also, of course, you know, golf, yeah, you're in that, in that sense, you know, obviously you're part of a team, but it's a very, you know, individually driven sport, but you're at West Point, And so you start to first I would think fill your tool bag with your, what would become leadership skills that would take you not only into the military, but into the business world. And tell me how West Point shaped you as a leader. Uh, well, West Point has a, uh, it's, it's mission criteria is around a raw candidate score. And so they look for um, attributes about someone and, and, certainly academics and you know, intellectual ability is something, physical ability. But really what they're looking for is resilience, is they're going to find a way in the four-year program to break you down, not to break your spirit, but to break you down and build back up. And so the ability to fail and get back up and go again is resilience. And um when I start to talk about kind of going through uh, the COVID, um, our code name for our company um, uh, on on this project is called Operation Resilience. And resilience is that ability to be able to take the hit, fall down, fail, get back up, try again, adapt, adjust, and and try again. And so that's really kind of the basis of of what they look for. And then the way they build it is the first person you have to be able to lead is yourself. Can you lead yourself? Can you lead yourself and do the things that are hard to do that are required of you? And can you prioritize your time? Because the number of things they ask you to do as a as a cadet at, at any of the military academies is more than you can physically do. There's just not enough hours in the day uh, to do that. They, they, they script your time. And so you have to make these choices and prioritize your time, which as a as an entrepreneur and a business owner, that is what you do all the time is prioritization of, uh, of kind of in, you know, what's urgent and what's important that for that grid square of how do I do things? How do I reserve my time to do things that are that are urgent and important and not get lost in things that are urgent and trivial? And mm-hmm. because that will fill up. I mean, every leadership book, every talk, I mean, you go to the Covey and it's the fill in the jar with the big rocks or the small rocks or the, you know, the sand. And I mean, it, it, that ability to actively and constantly adjust how you spend your time um, as a business leader, as a, uh, as an entrepreneur and as a, as a cadet at West Point is that constant adjustment of new information and a constant reprioritization of where I spend my time. Well, and then, um, and I want to get back to that because there's something that, um, you, it was, you were made, uh, aware of it and you shared it with me. And it's whenever I started researching this, uh, this word that, uh, few people use enough or understand the power of it, which is no. And so you talk about prioritization. So I want to come back to that, but, uh, let's, uh, let's take you out of, out of West Point and then you're serving. And I tell you what, it was probably one of our early conversations, Colin, that with you, that it really, became clear to me that these leaders, these soldiers um, that are basically defending this nation are kids. They're so young. And I remember whenever you were describing to me your early uh, military career after you'd finished West Point and you were serving, uh, how young you were as an officer leading other you know, 18 and 19 year olds to defend the most powerful nation on planet earth. So 
talk to me a little bit about those early days whenever you were so young and you've had and you're having to apply in real life those things that you've been prepared for at West Point. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really kind of kids leading kids um, in, in, a, in a sense. So as a as a second lieutenant or, you know, uh, ensign in the Navy or whatever, you're 22 years old coming out of it and you've gone through this rigorous program to prepare you for it. But at the end of it, you really kind of don't know anything. And um, it, it's a it's a it's a terrific exercise in understanding uh, humility and um Yes, I have trained for this. Yes, I've gone through this, but I don't know what I don't know. And that's where the, the backbone of, of the military um, is the non-commissioned officers. And so I was blessed to have Sergeant Ronnie Watson as my first platoon sergeant. And um, and I just just said, how do I do this and how do I do this well? How do I do this with excellence? And how do we lead this unit and prepare these folks that if we get the phone call, we're ready to go, and and our and our, our our unit is ready to go, and that we're 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 tested, and we sweated in peace, so that we don't bleed in in war. That that mentality of what do we have to do? And he said, "Sir, if you let me, I will teach you, and you will learn what you need to learn." And I think, you know, as a young person coming up, um, that ability to be able to um, lead at the same time, be able to be led by those around you. And I think, you know, the, the, anytime you're building a team, you want to build folks, you want to build a team with, that are smarter than you, right? You want to surround yourself by people that know more, can do more, are capable of more, and that ability to truly listen and take the feedback and adjust um, is ultimately where teams win and where they fail. Because otherwise, you know, in a, in a, in an entrepreneurial setting, you're limited by the capability of the founder. Right. And so if you want to be limitless, then you've got to have a team around you that is exponential in, in, in its ability. And so I think that that early piece of it, um, I applied that. And I think, you know, when I think back of kind of how I got there, it's how my grandfather ran his golf course. And so he ran, uh, it was a PGA pro and he ran uh, golf courses in, in Houston, River Oaks in Houston. And then golf clubs in, in, in South Louisiana, and then uh, ultimately bought a club, and that's where I grew and learned. But that's how he ran it, is he just had this quiet humility and grace about him. And I just, you know, sitting next to him for seven or eight years as I learned to play golf, I also learned kind of the, the, the game of golf and game of life and the game of, and the game of business. Wow. And so then from there, you end up, uh, well, let's see. Do you go to you went to graduate school pretty soon thereafter, right after you finished your military career? Yeah, I did. Yeah, so I uh, left the army, went to uh, LSU, got an MBA, and then went to Enron. There you go. And there, there and we go. And, and it's uh, and there we go. So now the now the Fortune 500 trip begins, and and which is so crazy because although we were both at Enron, we didn't know each other at that time. But yeah. as a result, we both end up at home, as, as a result of Enron's <laughs> and failure. That's right. Yeah, their failure. We end up working for, as we refer to it, Uncle Homer, but the, the rest of the audience knows as the Home Depot. And so, yeah. uh, so I'll never forget. <laughs> My first, our first day there. Oh my goodness. Uh, we're on a bathroom break and I come out and you just had this perplexed look on your face. The first thing you tell me is, I didn't go to business school for this. <laughs> and so, and um, but I tell you what though, okay, now that's funny. And we've got all kinds of funny stories about, um, about Home Depot. Which is a which, by the way, to the listener, is an incredible company. Um, we were there at a weird time. We went whenever uh, the the legendary and I mean cap all caps legendary leadership of uh, Bernie Marcus and Arthur Blank. They had both now they were hiring. They had just hired their very first outside CEO and a guy named Bob Nardelli, who while was is will, will ever will forever go down in the annals of Home Depot's history as a very unpopular character did a lot of things that that company needed at the time they were just very unpopular and, and you know he he made some mistakes too but one of the things he did is he started a program that brought 
Colin Barbado and Jason Wright's lives uh, uh, together. But you know, before I get into, and I, I mean, we'll, we'll dabble around with some of the the goofy stories of, of Home Depot. But now that we're both uh, older, wiser, and probably I don't know about you, although I'm pretty sure I do. I look at young Jason and young Cullen much differently than I did being young Jason and young Cullen. For the listeners, because as you know, Cullen, um, I talk to a lot of undergrads that either want to start their own business or they're just graduating and hoping to land a job somewhere to get their career kicked off and started. And so I'm always trying to share whatever wisdom I've gleaned throughout my career. Um, What would you tell Jason and what were we like 20? How old were we? 25, 26? Yeah. 20, it was like yeah, 20, 20, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like so that. knowing what you know now, much wiser, Colin, what would you tell those guys that were so, and by the way, listener, full transparency, you're talking about two guys that were, we didn't think so. We thought we were just humble Christian boys from the South that are, that were doing the right things, but we were arrogant, entitled, and unappreciative, and uh, yeah, and we were respectful. Yeah, yeah, we were everything that our mothers did not raise us to be. If I'm just being completely transparent, so what would you tell those guys seriously? Um, because they because those guys represent a lot of kids coming out of school right now. Yeah. So I think, uh, I mean, the things that, you know, the things that people say about millennials today or that generate, I mean, it, it's, it's that age group. Um, I read this uh, article in, um, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, and it was, it was a piece, you, you had to read the entire article, but it goes through and it describes uh, young people and, and that lack of, uh, lack of awareness and think that they're smarter than everybody else. And it goes on to describe it. And then at the end of it, it says, this is an article reprinted from a 1984 publication. Oh, wow. And it was just this, this, the same description of it. And I think it's this, that time in your life where you know a little bit and you just don't know what the world has in store for you and what it takes to get there. It all looks so simple mm-hmm. and so easy at that stage of life is coming out of school in business school, it's, I mean, all the case studies are, they all work out, right? I mean, yeah. and, and you can cover it in, you know, in a couple hour read and you can, and you can debate it in class and you have, and you get to have these discussions, especially in a, in business school, um, you get to have these discussions of like, you're the CEO or you're on this, you're in the C-suite. And so they put you in these positions and you're woefully ill-equipped to be in that position because you haven't made enough mistakes yet. You haven't learned. Leadership is a full contact sport. It is only learned by playing it. And, you know, from playing football, watching football and yelling at the TV is very different than getting hit in the face. And and leadership and owning a business is is a full contact sport, not in a physical sense, but it tests everything that you have about it because it tests your will. It tests your emotional range. Can you relate to people? And it gets you out of your comfort zone. And I think you know, the, the advice I would give to young people is just be patient and build competence and build confidence uh, over time. And you may know some things and you may end up being right. But as a young person, you don't get to make the decision and you don't wear you don't bear the weight of the decision being wrong. And the cost of, you know, uh, you run, you know, multiple businesses and you've made mistakes. And sometimes those are really hard mistakes and they hurt. Um, And so wearing the weight of responsibility of being able to make that decision and making a decision from afar or from a cubicle that is multiple levels away is vastly different than, uh, than the effects of it. And, and you don't have the full knowledge and you don't have the full picture of it. You don't know the other competing interests. And that's the, the challenge of leadership is these all these competing interests. This may be the right course, but I don't have the board's backing. I don't have the financial resources to do it. I need to hit a number in order to do this. Or in in some of these things that I've been a part of and continue to work on is, are we going to be able to pay vendors this week? You know, am I going to make payroll? And so, yeah, I would love to go do this really cool strategic initiative, young person. That makes sense. But 
what you don't know is I'm trying to figure out how to give, keep you paid this week. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you that. Right. And that's yeah. the part that you just, you don't have that lens to look through of what's actually happening behind the scenes. And so the advice I would give is just be patient. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that you did better than me because we both wanted to, and by the way, you know, we didn't want to get out of Home Depot because it was this horrible, terrible place to work. Not by any means. Again, great company with an incredible DNA. Uh, but you know, both, I mean, literally I've got somewhere our master's plan for, you know, from our first trip to the master's, I've kept that all these years, you know, Colin yeah. and I both wanted to go out and conquer the world as entrepreneurs yeah. and, um, CJ chicken shack. There you go. CJ's yeah. chicken shack, still a phenomenal idea, by the way, every time I Five go finger to discount. That's right. Every time I go to five, every time I go to first Monday trades day, I think there should be a CJ's chicken shack here and the chicken dance song should be playing. There should be one of us on top of it in a chicken suit, throwing out hot rolls to get people to come <laughs> buy our, uh, buy our, the greatest chicken fingers they've ever had. Uh, which by the way, we had that idea yes, before we Canes did. ever became really big and Kane uh, took no. it to, and scaled it to a level that really, I mean, Kane's, is just CJ's on a really big level. Yeah. Let's be honest, you know. Well, I, so. I mean, I kind of, I mean, it's got a C in the name. It, <laughs> I mean, I kind of take credit for it. Yeah, they, mean, they, they, they we had that idea. We wrote it down. I knew we someone were, was listening to us back then. Yeah, that's, well, it must have been the people that we, when we missed our flight because we were talking. <laughs> because, <laughs> because we're sitting there yucking it up at the airport and all of a sudden it's like, man, why is our plane not boarding? Well, that's because you're at the wrong gate, you goofballs. Uh, yeah, a couple of, couple of real whiz kids right there. Yeah, they can <laughs> run into the payphone to call our wives and say, yeah. uh, I'm not going to make it back. Oh, what happened? Well, I missed the flight. Oh, I'm sorry. What happened? Well, boy, we were laughing up and didn't hear the gate change. <laughs> and <laughs> so we'll see you tomorrow. We'll we literally tomorrow. we literally run up and watch our plane go shh, like I have a movie. It's like, oh, there it goes. Wow. Yeah. But you were more patient and you you stuck around longer than I did and got to do some really cool stuff. And I think you exercise. I've watched that through your career because, you know, uh, you know, being on the uh, the corporate side of retail, which which, by the way, again, to the to the listener out there that is young, if you want to get incredible experience, if you can work in a retail environment, retail just covers it all. You've got a bunch of people, you've got product, you've got uh, you, you just got so many facets of just good raw business. And you stayed and got to work with some of the basically the startups within the big, you know, uh, the big orange uh, ship, uh, which I commended. But and so. Take us through some of the things that you, by staying and learning and being a part of some of that decision-making process that I never got from a big company standpoint because I bailed. I got sick of it and went and, you know, <laughs> bought the first real estate company, which by the way, that you scouted for me, you know, you were, yeah. we, we drove to Tyler and it was you that walked into that office the first time, look around, you came back and you go, wow, you got some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh goodness, yes, I did. Well, I mean, like many Pearl sitting at the front desk, uh, <sighs> grading you was, uh, yeah, yeah, was yeah, in the wood paneling. But um, yeah, so back to you know, back to Home Depot. I think you know the I, I got the opportunity, and I think this is one of the the other piece of advice I would get is I I ended up working for someone um, who ended up becoming just an incredible mentor. It was the first, I think. Uh, it, the first person that I encountered that somebody that lived out their faith in the corporate environment. And I had never experienced anybody actually doing that. I mean, me being of, of faith and, and, and a, and a, and a strong believer and I lived out my faith, but I'd never seen anybody actually live it out in a leadership role and, and bring it to work. And so I got the opportunity to work for somebody like that. And it, and it altered, um, it altered my my worldview and it altered my view of how to use how to how to spend my time there is is run the race that God called you to run and it's not the race that I'm imagining for myself or I'm comparing against other people of what I need to do and he sat me down at this one point and I felt like I needed to be promoted and if you've got young people on your team I mean how many times have you had this conversation of I think I should be promoted. Well, you're not ready for it. 
And his advice to me is he said, Colin, you can, you may get to this level and we may promote you early, but there's going to be a longer waiting period somewhere else that is going to require you to stay in another role longer because you're just not ready for it. You haven't, you haven't had enough experiences. You haven't had enough failures. You haven't had enough opportunities to succeed, enough opportunities and just enough reps. And, you know, enough reps re such resonated with me because it's it to me, it, it was back to golf, right? Of how many range balls that I hit, you know, the, the, the thing of you got to do something 10,000 hours to become an expert. I, well, I did. I played golf for 10,000 hours and it, the, it, the light bulbs all went off for me of, I just need enough reps of leading projects and leading business and leading teams. And I just need enough reps and then I will develop the skills for it. Um, and so it gave me just a sense of patience there to go, oh, okay, well, I'll just keep doing, I'll just keep doing and delivering value more than I get paid and find a way to be useful and develop skills. And all of a sudden it became somewhat of a game. And it was kind of a game like getting through West Point of, hey, there's a there's things that you have to do to in order to get through this and kind of survive. And then there's things that you can do to thrive in any environment. And so it became somewhat of a game to me of, oh, okay, these are the things I have to do in order to to learn and be a part of the organization. But here's some things that I can really contribute and thrive and and go after the things that I'm interested in and I want to learn and grow and, and kind of make a name for myself. Um, so it, just slowing the, you know, like as any athlete will tell you, is when the game gets slower, you get into your peak performance. And if you can slow down the game for you at, at work, um, the decisions become easier because the, all the pitches aren't coming at you so fast. You, you've got time to kind of evaluate and go, okay, what am I, what do I need to hit here? What, what ball is being thrown at me? Well, and I think one of the things, too, that, um, you know, Dave Grohl, the uh, founder of Foo Fighters, you know, formerly the drummer for Nirvana, he said something really cool one time that I always had a hard time with. You know, my pay, what you said has been one of my – there's two things that have really crushed me um, throughout my career at different times, and it's it, lack of patience, like you said. It wasn't only – I always created this arbitrary timeline for myself that I had to achieve these certain milestones that just didn't matter, you know, and so just doing the work really hard. But Dave Grohl said, uh, he said, you know, if you do something really, really well for long enough, someone will notice. It's just going to, you were never going to not notice Lou Gehrig playing by, you never, you're never going to not notice that at some point, somebody's going to go, wow. Oh, guy's really good he's not and, and i think that young people i know that i did this we think that the way that you move up is to go to think you're really good at it and go prove to people you are with by just saying it or acting it or kind of playing the role instead of just going and just doing the work you were never going to not notice jack welch the guy was brilliant he was an incredible leader there was the the you know the i you know whereas now i will say you know, supposedly out in Hollywood, there are a bunch of actors that are just as good as Brad Pitt. They just haven't been discovered. OK, maybe that's the outlying industry. But for the most part, if you're really, really good at something and can produce results, eventually people are going to notice. Um, and that was one of the things that I had a hard time with. And so I think that's what you executed on. Well, and I, I'll never forget one of my uh, early mentors, a guy named John Bauer. He told me, he said, if you'll just do something long enough, people will pay you a lot of money to do it eventually. He said, if you just go, because the better you get at something, if you get really, really good and you know a lot, it's a lot cheaper to just pay you a lot than to have five people that don't know anything and try to teach them how to do it or go through that learning curve. It just works. All the odds are in your favor that if you will just, just be patient and do the work and let people judge you by the fruit of that work, uh, so, you know, and I thought you did that really well through our, uh, through the Home Depot tenure because, and that guy that you're talking about is Todd, right? Was yeah, that, Todd uh, Williams. Yeah. 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 I, I, rem I remember you telling me about, I never met Todd, never had a conversation with Todd, uh, but, 
I remember he had such a profound impact on you that uh, uh, you had mentioned him to me. So I think that's incredible advice. So now you find yourself, you you went from Home Depot, you go to DG, where you really, uh, I think that's where if, if I were just gauging from the outside looking in, you stepping up and rising as a as a corporate leader where you've got a you got a lot of revenue like billions of dollars of revenue responsibility lots of people lots of stores um you're you're truly leading an army of of retailers in the corporate setting take us through some of the things and that by the way knowing you as well as I do it seemed to me that was the point where you started really learning to focus and and train very purposefully what's between your ears where you were learning you you decided to self educate on how do i become not just a better uh, a, a, yes a better business person better leader but how to become a better steward of my resources where do i become a better father and husband and just kind of started that's where i saw you start to put in practices and disciplines to really really sharpen your blade as a human. So kind of take, take us through, but I, but I also know with all the success you were having at DG, uh, financially and otherwise, you were still miserable to a certain degree. So kind of walk us through some of that. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, the, the thing about being a, a leader is it's got to, the, the best leaders are authentic leaders. It's, there's not, they're not, they're not playing a role. And I think that's one of the, one of the traps people get into is they, especially as they get promoted is they feel like, um, if I'm in this role, I need to act a certain way. And um, the best leaders are the ones that have honed their craft over time. They've led themselves really well, or they've learned to, then they've led smaller groups and they've, they've honed their craft as to, this is how I'm going to be as a leader. And I got my first real taste of owning who I was as a leader. And so I stepped into this organization um and um it was a, a dollar general and rapidly growing company we had just been taken private by kkr um heavily levered up a um, lot of pressure to deliver results deliver new new stores um a lot of pressure to grow margin and grow revenue um an incredible leadership team that was assembled so to be a part of that was it was an incredible journey but i got hit really hard retail back then was very much of an old line you do what i say and i don't want to hear anything about it it was yes sir no sir and it doesn't matter what it was you just did it and it was command and control top driven um left over from a legacy of you know maybe former military folks if that's how they kind of led but that was kind of the environment and that was not the that was not the type of leader that i was going to be good at doing and kind of six months into the gig, um, uh, I, they created this role, kind of this, uh, a, uh, a blend between tactical execution and and strategy. So I had you know a couple thousand stores. It was about three billion dollars in revenue, and I was kind of straddling this line of tactical execution and strategy. And so the strategy piece came really easy to easy to me. And then the execution piece of it, I was a lot younger than everybody else. And they had this style of leadership that was so different than what I was. And my boss at the time was like, you are not going to make it if you can't become this kind of leader. And I remember looking at her and going, I believe that I believe that my style will actually will end up working better in the long run. And I'm willing to bet that I can make it work. And, and she, she, she made that bet with me. Um, and it, six months later, we we're having a conversation and everything changed. And I had the buy-in of all of these kind of grizzled uh, retail veterans of that. I was in it for their success. And that was the test for me is, is the, the ultimate sign of a leader is growing other leaders. And if you can grow leaders and if, their best interest is my best interest. And I don't care about me. I care about their success. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the whole paradigm changed. And she came to me and said, you were right. You can get them to do things that I can't get them to do. And so 
then all of those other skills that I had accumulated at Home Depot and working on different projects that I didn't really understand why I was doing it. And boy, this just seems to be a dead end job. And I'm not sure if I really like this work. Well, all of those skills kind of came to came to bear and I could use that in that moment and I could cut data and do data analysis. Everybody else is printing out these massive reports and using highlighters and rulers and I'm extracting the data and doing pivot tables and and exception based analysis. And I'm giving my team this kind of shortened list to go, hey, go go fish in this hole right here because these are the stores that need help. And now all of a sudden that takes that burden off of them. And so they're now free to go execute. And all I want them to do is I want them to win. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I kind of like this style. And so that was where it all kind of came together for me of, boy, this is really and I think I go back to God uses everything. He he just he has a way. Every experience, every failure, every dead end, every detour, every cul-de-sac that you drive down and go, oh, I'm lost again. It comes back years later and you go, oh, now I see how God's going to use that. I'm going to use that experience and I'm going to either use it to light the path for someone else and help them or I'm going to ride sit next to them. And I'm, I'm going through this with one of the other companies that I uh, help with is going through this kind of traumatic experience on a personal, on a personal level and trying to run a business. Well, I've done that. I know what that feels like. And I know really what that feels like. And you're not offering platitudes and you're not offering, you know, Instagram scripture quotes. It's, I know what this feels like. And I know that God is so real and he's bigger than this what you're dealing with, he's bigger than all of it. I promise you, he's bigger and he's there in the high and he's there in the lowest of lows. I mean, I had a you know a business being you know, a fast forwarding. I get, I started a, a you know a, a business. We tried to launch a product and it, it collapsed. It failed. It didn't work. Uh, we just we we screwed up in the due diligence. We screwed up and and you know to to go through what I thought was probably the the biggest possible failure I could go through and know that God's exactly the same he doesn't change at the at the lowest of that now i get the opportunity to sit with entrepreneurs that are going through you know their own challenge and say hey you're going to be okay whether this fails or not it has nothing that you are not a failure because a business fails businesses fail for lots of reasons they might fail because of you made a you made a catastrophic strategic blunder but that doesn't make you a failure that just means you you learned don't do that again Right. You know, right. It, kind of what the Edison quote of right thousand, you know, you know, I just figured out a thousand ways that a light bulb doesn't work. You know? Exactly. And, and you just have to have that kind of resilience, that relentless pursuit of optimism of, hey, that didn't work, but I learned something from it. So I'm good with it. And let's let's go on to the next thing. And so that kind of leads us up to uh, knowing there's some uh, there's some other data points between, you know, there and now but i think right now that gives the the listener for sure a, enough of a flavor to bring them up to speed as to why you have been called on uh throughout and, and why you're uh certainly qualified for the environment we find ourselves in right now which is you know there's uh i mean you know, like i told you i mean we're, we're one of them uh, you know jimlin and i uh, being small business owners well you know whenever you're in that retail environment and you're told by the government you cannot allow customers inside your stores that can be a little tricky you know yeah uh, <laughs> that changes things and so i know that you're right in the middle of this um doing advisory work for several uh for several companies kind of talk to me about how are you advising these business leaders to weather this and and just kind of boots on the ground for as an eyewitness what is it what is it doing what how how is the business landscape literally in real time as we speak how is it changing as a result and what kind of what do you see on the other side of it yeah so i, I mean i think we've all just been you know hit upside the head of you know what this is and i mean there's no um there's no strategy planning to go from uh, 100% revenue to zero revenue overnight and which is one of the businesses had to face and so kind of what do you what do you do with that and i think the way that i think about it is this at first it's just survive right and then i think there's this um phase that you have to go through and there it's hunker down it's 
react command and control of kind of what's all the information coming into and all you have the bandwidth mental and emotional bandwidth is um what is the change because i mean going through this it was every hour the situation was changing and we're shutting you know facilities down and what does that look like and then you're trying to make sure that you're giving enough direction for um for your team and giving them some assurances. And so how do you safely shut these businesses down and these facilities down? How do you give enough um, assurances to your team that it's going to be okay, we're going to be fine, even though you may not know that it's going to be fine at that moment. And so you've got to be able to give that assurance. So behind the scenes, you've got to be feverishly working through cash flow modeling. Okay, all right, what does this really look like? And how do we how do we extract costs out of this thing so that we can give some assurances to our team to say, hey, we're going to be okay. And um, that ability to be able to kind of, uh, that ability to be able to um, real-time plan, real-time react, at the same time, do some forward planning, crude and unusual and, and bizarre. And I mean, some of the models we had early on and some of this, you know, we would start one and then the situation would change and then we'd blow up and we'd have to start another one. And then we'd blow up and start another one. And then eventually settled into, um, you know, get alignment with with your board or your equity backers or whoever and debt holders or whatever and say, all right, here's a plan to get us. And, and just the, the humility to be able to say, hey, look, all we can see is two weeks out. That's all we can do at this point. I can't see out. I don't know how this is going to turn out. And so you kind of get into that survive mode and then you then then you shift into this what we call reemerge mode and go, all right, now we've got we've we've hunkered down, we've figured out a cash flow and we can we can survive for some amount of time. And what does it look like to reemerge? And so how do we want to come out? And so we started with, you know, what do we absolutely have to have, you know, to, to reemerge? And so we prioritize things in this kind of must have, we have to have this. Well, we should have this. It would be really nice if we had this. And if we have the time and the bandwidth and the resources, to, here's a could have list. And so we've got a list of 50 things that we're working on as a team. And oh, by the way, let's see if we can take it now that we've got an entire business shut down. How do we how do we engage all of those folks into helping us figure out our reemergent plan? What what better way to a uh, team to come together and coalesce around? re-emerging together, then get everybody engaged in what the re-emergent plan is. And so it's this kind of open hand, okay, and hey, let's solve, how do we take advantage of this time? So we created curriculum plans. And so everybody's going back to school on how to be a, you know, how to manage, uh, how to manage a facility. How do you clean it? How do you, how do you take care of customers? And, you know, um, including our finance folks and our marketing folks and our club folks, and they're all working on these projects together. And they're working with people they've never worked with before because the organization spans, you know, 14 states. And so how do you, boy, there's some really benefits that come out of this. Now people have a, a deeper level of connection of working on something together and go, boy, we're, we're going to come out of this. We're not just going to come out of this. We're going to come out of this and thrive. Yeah. And then the, then the other, the, the third phase of it is this reimagine phase of, Boy, how do we want to emerge as a business that's completely different than where we are today? Do we want to attack this in a completely different way? And some of this is a franchise model, so you, you're, you've got to work within the. But you know, we can influence the franchisor, and we've done that, and we can do some things. But how do we want to go attack this? And we're going to reorg. You know, uh, we're going to reorg how we how we go about doing it to make us leaner and more nimble, and put and pull out. Um, pull out some folks and then empower some folks to be able to really run their business so that, and then give them some resources that we reorg, we can redeploy those resources, those capital resources and give them some tools to really run their business and put the resources closer to the customer. So that it's not this kind of evolving bureaucracy where it's got to come up and then a decision gets made and then it gets pushed down. And how do you, how do you take your best leaders, trust them, empower them, give them some more resources let them make the decision. Um, and so boy, we got really excited as a team thinking about this reimagine of how we do it. And, you know, another business that um, that I help with is an industrial supply business. And um, about six or nine months ago, um, we were having a conversation. He's telling me about what he's doing with his um, 
uh, how he's managed his inventory. They were growing. They split the warehouse. They have a warehouse in Houston and one in, in Charlotte. And I'm asking him some questions about, you know, the, you know, how long is he holding his inventory? And, um, and he's like, well, I don't really know. I mean, here's my average. I'm like, you, you know, Brian, you've got to understand what's the, what's the, and this is where retail comes back into, into play is that you remember this from Home Depot, Gimroy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, gross margin return on investment. And, you know, what's the profitability? What's the gross margin dollars I'm getting for the every dollar I invest in that piece of inventory? So we went through that journey and I got a note from him the other day and said, thank God we started this work um, when we did because it freed up so much cash flow that it's not tied up in dead inventory that I think we're going to be OK. I mean, we're going to need the government programs to get to really get through it. But he said we wouldn't have. I mean, we would have been really in in deep in the deep deep end of the pool without without a lot of hope had we not freed up the cash flow and so i think you know i mean that uh, that um ability to be able to look at your business from afar and it's hard when you're in the middle of a of a of a storm like this to be able to step out of it and go okay now let's look at this thing with fresh eyes and say what do we need to do differently in order to make ourselves better and leaner coming out of this because god doesn't god does not um forget to use any experience and that that resilience as a leader that resilience as a person that resilience as a christ follower just builds character and it builds um it 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 allow it it's it provides hope it provides hope in a time where it's kind of I mean, if you watch the news it's hard to find a lot of hope and so you know, I, I think, and that's ultimately what a team needs to hear from its leadership is hope and optimism of there is a better day and there is a path forward for all of us to, 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 to win together. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's the approach that Jim Lynn and I took with hot tots is, you know, even if it meant me going out on Instagram and Facebook and, you know, making a fool of myself to create some silly content, I told her, I said, you know, I said, one of the things that I want to be for our customers and any other business in Tyler, I don't care if you have a tire shop, a coffee shop, or whatever that's impacted by this. If you come to our social media and you see you and I laughing, being silly, we can't even let customers in here. It's all curbside and deliveries, but whatever. Just that sense of them going, okay. Well, if ever there should be a business that's scared or frightened, it should be them. They're, they're retail, they're brick and mortar, and they're still happy. They're still having fun. They're still going at it. Okay. And I said, that, that is what will sustain us through this. And, you know, I, I think it's so right, Colin, that I think, you know, and, and, and again, not all, not all businesses are alike. It's all relative to the, to the world in which you occupy at the moment. But I think a lot of businesses and, um, I mean, households are, are going to come out on the other side of this thing better for, for this. I mean, it's crazy. Generally speaking, when you suffer through something like what we're going through right now, if you choose to, you will come out much better on the other side of it. And I, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, <clears throat> you know, before I got on with you today, I interviewed a guy from the Department of Energy and we were talking about how you know, this is an incredible time to be alive. I mean, to, to, and he made the point that, could you imagine if this had happened 20 years ago? I mean, it would not be the same deal. What, we, what we're realizing is that the technology and stuff that we use just kind of passively or whatever, it can be put to critical use, you know? And um, I don't know. I, I, I just, I'm very optimistic that the other side of this thing, the, it, yes, it's going to look different. Yeah, we're going to go through some pain. We're going to go through some pain, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's, you know, hope it's having only positive expectations. That's a very powerful thing. And so, uh, well, now as far as well, your person, go ahead. Before you, before you jump on, I, I think there's another thing, uh, hot tots of, well, that you, that you, you missed is the, the decision that you guys made whatever a year ago, nine months ago to build a, a platform that integrated your online and your brick and mortar sales was a critical strategic um, 
step that allows you to do and allowed you to do what you're doing today. Because I think Absolutely. had you not done that, you would have been, I mean, it could have been done manually having the separate things, but, you know, going through that and that was not an easy journey by any stretch. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I drug but, my wife kicking and screaming <laughs> the whole way. <laughs> but, you know, those 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 big strategic moves, um, you know, and kind of looking, you know, being able to look backwards and go, boy, aren't you really aren't you so glad you made that pain, that choice? I think businesses are having to make that choice today and go, OK, what do I need to do? What do I need to pivot in my business? And I think we're going to see a ton of businesses figure out how to do online or do digital or do curbside or do I, I'm excited to see what's what comes out of this, what new businesses emerge out of something like this. I mean, it's something around healthcare and something around, you know, you know, how we manage that. But I think the existing businesses and how they pivot and adjust, I think is going to be really, it's going to be cool to see what comes out of it. It, it is. And, you know, I tell you, it's just, um, it's really cool. Just humans just kind of take just about any, you know, I guess it was Vince Lombardi that said that the human, uh, the human body is the most magnificent of all machines and that it can endure almost anything. And just watching humans adapt and adjust, it's just, it's awesome. I just, I get excited just to watch the stuff that people come up with and, 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 and figure, figure stuff out, you know, yeah. just, just, it, I, it's just fun. And, and I'm amazed by what, what human beings can just figure out and just keep going because there is no stopping. The world's going to keep spinning. You know, yep. it ain't going to stop just because this has happened. We can shut down the economy. We can destroy the economy, but the world's going to keep, the train's going to, is going to keep on a trucking, whether, you know, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Um, okay. Well now talk to the listener a little bit as we kind of get closer to the end of this thing. I, I mentioned early on the powerful use of the word no. I know that, you know, at some point, of course, you and I are both, you know, we're, we're uh, voracious readers and we're constantly trying to better, you know, that's one of the things that you and I have always shared in common. We're always trading, you know, what we've read and, you know, be it in the, uh, what it's Andy Stanley and the more of the kind of the, the guy that's an incredible church leader who could also be the CEO of any Fortune 500 company or whatever the case may be, or purely secular uh, methodology. Talk about how powerful the word no became and you're like, cause I'm, I've, I've discovered it as well. And then just where, and, and to give the listeners some ideas about some, some things that you've put into practice that have uh, shaped the leader that you, that you now are. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the power of no is um, I, I think at one level is, and I teach this to my kids is if you say yes to something, the next thing that comes along that may be better than what you said yes to the first time now is, is no longer an option and reserving your, uh, your bandwidth, your emotional, your mental, your spiritual, your, you know, whatever bandwidth so that you have the best opportunity. And it's about opportunity cost of your time, right? Of if I say yes to another uh, and I, you know, and I, I learned this the hard way of, If I say yes to another um, board invitation to join some, you know, this group to do something or be on a committee at the at the church or at this other group or this other company, if I say yes to it early on, it's a it's an ego stroke of like, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that seems like a really great thing for me to do. And I would love to be a part of that. But when I say yes to that, all of a sudden, my family, I'm saying no to them unintentionally. It wasn't part of who I wanted to be. It wasn't who I said I was going to be. It was just because I said yes to all these other things, I was in effect saying no to these things. And so um, I went through this exercise with um, with uh, on uh, drilling into you know, my personal mission, vision, and values, and who I wanted to be as a person, and who God was calling me to be, and using that as the filter to say yes or no to things. And so it wasn't a, uh, each choice wasn't this discrete of, 
oh, if I tell that person no, are they going to, you know, are they are they going to think less of me or is it um, am I going to, you know, am I going to damage, you know, a relationship? And so you can get into these twisted kind of um, point systems or whatever of trying to make these decisions. And really, none of that even matters if um, if you have a who you are and who God's called you to be. And here's what's important to me. And I went through this exercise and, and, and it and it's not a it's not a cursory kind of you just sit down for a little while and you jot some stuff down. It, it is kind of the the um, uh, Tozer has this has this um, passage in his in, in in his book around the the ripping out of pride out of your out of your out of your soul. And it's just this kind of gut wrenching piece of releasing that pride of who you are and really who has God called you to be. And then using that as the filter. And all of a sudden there's this just there's this freedom in decision making around um, I'm saying yes to the things that I that I know to be true about who I am as a person, who God's called me to be, who I want to be as a father, as a husband, as a leader, um, as a follower of Christ. Who is that? And now I'm filtering it through that. So now I have I don't feel bad about saying no to anything. If it goes through that filter, there's not this there's not this shame or guilt or any of that. It's just, hey, when I filter it through this, it makes it through the list. And I think this is the right thing for me to spend my time and I can balance all of the other places in there. Otherwise, it's just no. And I'm OK with no. Yeah, I love it. And I think that is so profound. And most, you know, a lot, you know, I've, I've blogged about this before, too, you know, like Bill Gates and uh Warren Buffett, you know, you'd expect if ever there were two guys with that you would think would have jammed calendars, it'd be them. And they're not. They keep their calendars wide open for exactly what you said. And actually, it was Buffett that taught it to Bill Gates. He's like, no, I keep my calendar open for that just incredible opportunity that I can't say no to. And, uh, you know, and Ryan Holiday has written about it, that that's kind of what he does. You know, And Tim Ferriss, I mean, Tim Ferriss literally just he won't. He's, you're not going to get Tim Ferriss to go to coffee with you or have lunch with you or anything like that because, you know, those guys obviously have more demands on their time than I do for sure. But just I know I learned it very early on and I did not practice it well being a young business owner. You think your job is to say yes to everything. You think you have to. You have to network and you cannot be seen as rude or whatever. But man, you end up, and how many times do you put something on your calendar only to dread it literally that afternoon and especially the day of whenever that thing is on your calendar that you committed to do? And you're like, dear goodness, why did I say yes to this? You know, I've stopped doing that. I just like, I'm not going to put myself in that position. I'm, no, I'm not going to do it. Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, one of the, um, th- one of the tricks that I've learned, I, I say trick or just, you know, um, things that I've learned around people network, wanting to network with me to either find a job or um, uh, uh, make some type of a sales pitch or, you know, introduction to somebody that I know is I've, I've gotten over the fact of, you know, I, of course I'll be courteous. Of course I'll be respectful of those things, but I'm going to ask some questions up front, some qualifying questions mm. to say, you yep. tell me what you want. And so, I mean, I'll take, a, you know, especially anybody, you know, a West Point grad that reaches out that wants uh, help, I always take the call. I'll always, I'll always fear it. But I'm going to ask a couple of questions of, you got to tell me, what do you want? Why do you want to do it? Where do you want to be? And how can I help? And if you can't answer those questions, then I really can't help you. And I'm not going to do the work that you need to do in order for me to help you. Yeah. If you've done the research and you go, yeah. you know, this person, I want to do this and here's why I want to do it, then I'll gladly go to that person and say, hey, I think you ought to talk to so and so because here's A, B and C. And now that conversation, instead of being an hour long of meandering through kind of where they want to be, it's if you can't answer these, then it's a it's a 10 minute phone call and it can be a very polite, right. very nice 10 minute phone call. But yeah. You know, and at, at, uh, and I would say probably two thirds of them end with me giving the advice of saying, "I think you really ought to spend some time thinking through these questions, 
before you continue pursuing, you know, your, your job search. And yeah. Uh, and that yeah. and and that's a little bit of you know a little bit of tough love um, uh, there, but um, I'd much rather give that and shine a light into somebody's life than just stringing them along with, oh yeah, I'll introduce you to that person, and then they they spend time and they you know they get their hopes up or they want you know something to happen. Is I'd much rather really truly help the person than just kind of coddling them along. No, I couldn't agree more. And I, I've, I've taken the same approach because you, I get those calls a lot. And it's like, you know, the old, it's not uh, what you know, it's who you know. Well, yeah, at a minimum, you better know at least what you want. If you don't even know that, then I'm sorry, I'm not going to waste their time. You're wasting my time and that's okay for now. You know, I'm not going to let you do it again, but I'm certainly not going to put my credibility on the line so that you can go waste theirs just to tell them, hey, well, I know you do this. This looks cool. And let's let help me figure out what I can do for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not, that's not yeah, and then look. sales, you know, sales pitches, you know, to me, if, it, if it's an interesting pitch and you've done your research and you've approached me on why you think you're a good fit, okay, I'll, get, I'll invest as much time to get to the next gating question, the next toll gating, but I'm not, you know, it's, it's going to be that first meeting or that first, you know, listen is, is it worth another meeting? Is it worth another schedule appointment and if it's not then that's okay i don't consider a waste of time because i'm going to invest the time because it could be an opportunity and and have the the bandwidth and the flexibility in my schedule to go absolutely i'll listen to that i'll listen to what you have to say right i'm not going to promise you i'm going to do anything after that first meeting but i'll listen to it the first time and if it if it warrants a second one then yeah then here's 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 what it takes to get to the next one um, and so having that criteria, at least loosely in your head of what you're going to do, because your trade off, if you fill up your calendar and that badge of honor that people like to wear around of how busy, busy they are. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you the last time I told somebody that that I was busy. And I might be. Yeah, I might no, be busy. I'm, and people will say, I know you're so busy. Yeah, I, no, I'm not too busy for you. I'm not. No, I'm no. I'm not too busy no. to make a meaningful connection with with somebody on my team, somebody you know, sort of my family, friends. Uh, I, those matter more than anything else than filling up my calendar with stuff. Is the relationship no. No, re- no. relationships, and this is kind of one of the things uh, kind of honed over time is relationships matter more than winning any argument. Amen. I could not agree more. All right. Well, before I let you go, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I know you've recommended some good books to me in the past. What should the the listeners of the Texas Titan podcast, what should they put in their library? Um, I just finished a book called Range and um, Mm. uh, incredible book. Uh, It just kind of blew my socks off of – about this journey of, you know, kind of professional life. And he goes through uh, different uh, genres of work. And it's, you know, he he takes you through the same theme of how we get really good at something is we're fed this lie of you have to do these things in order to be successful. You have to be, in order to get into a good college, you have to, you know, be a, you know, an A student, you have to play the flute, you have to do these things and in order to get there. And then you get into a university and you have to specialize and you have to become, you know, you have to pick a major at 18 and then specialize and get a master's in something. You have to drill down into this highly specialized world. And then you get this really myopic kind of view of the world and you don't see all of the other opportunities. And he takes you through this journey of uh, inventors. I mean, like the, uh, great jazz musicians they don't know how to read music they just play and they take yeah. all these journeys yeah. and stuff that doesn't work and if you listen to a great jazz ensemble you don't know where they're going to go they don't know where they're going to go and there's not a stick of music <laughs> right. you know in there um and then the guy that invented the uh game boy n- not from a gaming company he was just a tinkerer he just liked to tinker with stuff and he just and so it was an incredible journey of of uh, of that um so um for all those folks that feel like they've missed out because they didn't specialize or they didn't, you know, get a, a master's degree in something, 
you, you can make an incredible impact on this world with the range of experiences that you that you've had thus far and continue to pursue them. I'll- I love that. All right. So that which everything you said there, I can't let you go without asking you this because of where Jack and Emily are, your children. You think they'll go to college? Um, I, I think I think we want to uh, make it available. And I think I want them to have do the work that it takes to have it as an option. I don't know. I don't know that yeah. I, I want them to have a, a view of life of give yourself as many options as you can and prayerfully consider those options and then make the best choice that you have with the information you have and whatever you choose. Yeah. I think uh, I, I remember you telling me this is um, I was trying to decide between two different job offers and, and you said, hey, Cullen, you, you're thinking of like God's on the other side of door A but he's not on the other side of door B. God's on the other side of both doors. Pick the one. Yeah. And, and I just, I don't know how many yeah. years ago, it started all sorts to jumble up of time of, of make the best decision you can make with the, with as many of the options as you can give yourself and with the information you have, and then go after it and put everything you have into it. And if it doesn't work or it doesn't turn out like you think, that's okay. You learned a whole bunch of stuff and then, then you'll be presented with some other options. I like it. I like it. I think that's fair. I, th- I just that that's something that I think that on this, I, you you've heard me rant about it already. Having two children at uh, big brand colleges, that um, I question it every day. And then with this uh, coronavirus thing, watching them work through Zoom, and then oh, you'll love this. You're gonna love this. So Abby, she comes to Jimlin and I last night. We're cooking dinner, and she uh, of course you know see you Boulder, and and by the way. Who wouldn't want to be in Boulder, uh, yeah. Colorado, as much as possible? Fine, fine place. I love yeah, going to Boulder. It's a, it's, a uh, place. it's it's awesome. So they're probably not going to be going back in the fall because it, it'll still be shut down, and who knows what it's going to look like going forward. But she, so she yes, she says last night. I mean, dead serious. She goes. So, I mean, next semester, even if I'm having to take classes at TJC, you know, here locally, Tyler Junior College, to keep classes going, you know, while they while she can't go back to Colorado. She said, I can still go to Boulder, right, and live in my apartment and just take classes online from TJC. <laughs> <laughs> yes, listener, just pause for a moment and giggle to yourself like we are. Well she's and, and her and her her rationale was, well, we've already paid the deposit on my apartment. <laughs> like oh dear dear heavens my sweet child so um yeah i think that uh, higher education is going to find itself in a really really tricky situation um james altucher who i listen to a lot i love his yeah. podcast i read his books you know he's a very i'm not to his to his point of being completely anti-college but i am much more pro uh, University of Texas, Tyler, Tyler Junior College, trade school. Unless you're going to be a physician, unless you want to be a uh, you know a, a true a truly licensed specialist, man. I mean, it's just uh, something's got to give. And I think that the I think that a, a big light has been shown as a result of this whole coronavirus thing. A light has been shown on higher education, and man, they're going to have a tough time rebounding. I, I just really believe that. So anyway, I just thought I'd get your yeah. take on uh, on that since you, you've got them uh, coming do. up, brother. Yeah, it'll, it'll be here yeah, before you know it. Colin Barbado, I love you, my brother. I've, I've loved this time. I am so glad that um, that uh, you are you come on the podcast. And like I said, I expect the resume to be changed. Uh, that LinkedIn profile should now ref- it can you can legally reflect that you're a Texas Titan. And uh, as, I appreciate your friendship uh, more than more than you know and your brotherhood. And so, Hey man, thanks for uh, coming awesome on the show to be with you. Thanks very much. Talk to you. All right, brother. I got it.